I, I literally wanted to know, is that the only thing you can do on TikTok is dancing? Is that it? It'll keep you entertained and fresh in your breath. I don't know a dumb doctor. <laughs> Man, that doctor's not smart at all. Stay home. Don't go anywhere. Just watch TV. You're doing it for your country. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Interviews and insight from this week in Cougar Sports. Every Saturday, only on BYU Radio. To lead off, here's the double coverage interview of the week. Joining us now for an outstanding second segment is the head football coach at BYU, Kalani Satake. Coach, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. All right. Uh, You heard the very end of our conversation uh, about Taysom Hill and comparisons and Hollywood actors. And uh, with no football happening right now, how often do you dive into Hollywood and all of these uh, social media storms? Um, I think that's a big part of what life's uh, going towards right now. You know, a lot of the uh, videos and challenges and things like that. And I think it's I've been really impressed with with uh, our community and with uh, especially with the leaders in our, in our church, our, our school, and our athletic department. And so uh, it's, just, it's a lot of fun. I think everyone's trying to stay positive and, and, and be optimistic about everything, just like we're trying to do as, as a football staff, you know. And, uh, but I, I think the uh, comparisons are fun as long as they don't attack individually and personally, and I think they'll be fine. Let's talk about um, Taysom Hill and what he's done in the NFL. You coached him as a mm-hmm. senior in your first year here. Um, what have you thought of what he's done in the NFL so far? Yeah, it just shows the, the type of young man that he is, just willing to do whatever is best with the team, whether it's being on kickoff, blocking punts, catching footballs, blocking, throwing the ball or running the ball. He, he'll do whatever it takes to win, and he's a super competitive person, a uh, great young man and, and a great teammate. You can see that he's already connected with Drew Brees and the rest of the team, and there's a reason why the Saints love him. You know, I, I just I know that his opportunity will come. I mean, there's there's – great ones that have played here that have gone on and waited behind other great ones like Steve Young and waited his time and when he was given the opportunity made some big time things happen and I think uh, Taysom has the ability to do that just waiting for him to get that opportunity. At what point does he cross into young man to just regular man? He's going to be 30 in August. I think he was a regular man right out of the womb. I think he <laughs> probably had six pack and, and, and guns you know uh, but I, I I think it's impossible for that guy not to be in shape. And so uh, looking forward to the next 30 years where we can see him out of shape a little bit, like <laughs> what happens to all of us. But, it's like the weirdest visual I've ever thought of in my life right there. <laughs> yeah, but it wouldn't surprise me if he still had six-pack you know, in, in his 50s, which isn't fair. Kalani Satake with us on BYU Sports Station. We'll get to the notable layoff in just a moment. But I've been thinking a lot, because I've had a lot of time lately, about – the, the importance of senior stars in their respective sports. And I look at what BYU basketball did this year with veteran leadership, with seniors and TJ Haas and Jake Toulson, Yoli Child, Zach Selyus, Dalton Nixon. They were so loaded. When you came in, you took over a team that had some real senior stars with Taysom Hill and Jamal Williams. What is it about having experienced senior stars that just helps your program take that next step? I think it's a combination of things. I think that the fact that they're seniors, it's their last go around, you know, and uh, there's a huge sense of urgency coming from the seniors. And so um, knowing that it's their last time and they want to go out with a bang, they're, they're, they tend to uh, be at the front a lot more. Um, what we've started to see is that a lot of the guys that have experience are taking over that urgency, and, and the seniors have done a great job, including from Taysom and Jamal and all those guys that were seniors before 2016. They've kind of set this um, the standard of uh, guys that have been on the field and have done things and, and really taken the initiative um, it helps to get guys coming back like, like Kyrus and, and Matt Bushman. But um, for the most part, I think the guys are starting to buy into uh, needing more of that leadership. Where we've struggled is guys that are uh, not enough seniors on the team. But I think right now we, we've got a good number of seniors. But more importantly, we have a, a number of uh, young men that have played and been on the field and have that experience. And um, the more, the, the, the better. For us, it's... It's now keeping everyone healthy and, and making sure that we're ready to go and, and we're currently just focusing on the present right now and how we can um, make this still competitive advantage for, for us concerning, you know, as far as uh, responding to what we're dealing with right now. Regarding um, what you are dealing with right now, let's talk about it. There's a lot to discuss. Uh, so spring ball is uh, postponed, not likely to resume at this point, I would, I would think, right? Yeah, I, I think uh, right now we're just focused on on – day-to-day, you know, and, and um, 
uh, just what, we're, what we can do right now with school and, and with our academics being done remotely through Zoom and, and Skype and all those things. And then um, working with communicating with our players, you know, our, our position coaches, our daily contact with our, with our players. And uh, we're daily contact with our with our leaders. With uh, I talk to Tom Homo uh, a lot more now uh, on the phone. And we, we had a great relationship and communicated really well before, but... It just seems like the, there's more of a necessity to, for us to be in contact more. And, and luckily, we have all these uh, different resources that can get us to meet and, and, and be around and, and talk without having to you know, be in person like I am here with you guys today. <laughs> Kalani Sataki on BYU Sports Nation. How do you effectively coach a team right now? What is your day-to-day like in terms of communicating with those guys and trying to keep them on course for what you hope is uh, the normal start to the 2020 season? I think rallying around each other, that's been the the, the positive thing about this is that I've seen some great things happen in in Cougar Nation and in our community, you know, whether it's um, people supporting local businesses and and helping them uh, continue to, to function or um, people with their families and spending more time with their families, doing different videos like TikTok and things like that, and all these dance challenges. And, uh, and I think it's um, I've seen I've seen it in my own neighborhood, just just families really hanging out and spending time together, and and it's been um, it's it's a positive. That I think it really help us. It, it gives our players a chance to go home and and realize what's the most important thing in their life. And and, and I think um, when things resume and things get back to where where they're normal. I think they're, they'll be a more committed uh, player and more committed to their goals, to their life, and and, try and, and not taking things for granted. So I, I think the the sense of gratitude is there, and and luckily we've been able to give been given that direction from our, you know, from our president to our athletic director. Tom Holmes has done an amazing job at, at instructing our coaches and and all the, all the coaches and and uh, the assistants to um, what our specific mission is to our players is take care of themselves, take care of their families and and each other, and that's been. Uh, a really cool rallying cry for everyone, and I've seen some really positive things from it, and just really impressed by uh, uh, just all the people, but more importantly, the the, uh, the Cougar Nation, and just uh, love all of them. So it's been really fun. I knew that I loved my family and valued my health, but what I've learned during this period too is what role sports plays in my life. I knew I loved sports too, and we don't have any of it. And now we kind of look ahead, and with the Olympics officially, uh, you know, announcing yesterday and this morning. That this is the latest sporting event canceled now through August 9th. You know what else is in August? Fall camp. We were discussing yesterday, Kalani, we don't know the answer, but just the fear that I, obviously health is number one and, and all of that, right? But that the football season could be delayed perhaps or who, know, who knows what happens. At, at this point, what's the conversation like with you guys related to the football season? I think just focusing on the present. And, and when things change so much, I mean, you know, it changes hour to hour. And so trying to keep everyone focused on the positive and, and being optimistic about everything, but more importantly, focusing on today and, and what we can do to, to be a better person today and what we can do to be stronger, uh, whether it's spiritually, physically, mentally, whatever it could be, you know, and, and um, uh, just trying to keep the focus on that. I, I don't think uh, thinking about August would really help much right now when we're in March still. So uh, just trying to get that done and, and just been really, I, I said I've been impressed with a lot of the people, but I, I'm going to tell you, I've been really impressed with our student athletes and uh you know the, the maturity that they they have showed in this time, but it's been it's unprecedented. You know, so uh, just really really impressed with our players, and just uh, thankful that I get I get to coach them, be around those guys. Would you need a full month to be ready for the season, like as a football team? It because we don't know when this is all going to clear up. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Hopefully, it's sooner than later. Would you need a full month like you have with fall camp currently built in? I think if everyone has the same amount of time, then they just you do with what you have, you know. And so, uh, I know that we had some uh, some spring practices, six of them, that other teams didn't even get to start spring. So, uh, whatever allows us to be on the same level, so that we all are on the same page and and be given the same amount of time to get ready for a season, then that that's fine with me. But uh, like I said before, that that's further down the road right now. We're trying to focus on today and and where things happen. So, and then, you know, it's crazy. We we uh, getting work, getting some instruction how to practice social distancing and and then get struck with an earthquake for the, a lot of the people up north and and uh, so there, there's a lot of times where we can still rally around each other and, and show that we support each other and I've been really impressed so far with everything that's been going on. Well, you face a number of unique challenges as the BYU football coach with missionaries being gone for two years and now in this pandemic. 
you have a bunch of student athletes that are returning early uh, or maybe will be reassigned. And so the scholarship juggle gets even more complicated. How are you approaching that? And how is that going to affect uh, this season, assuming 2020 goes off in September? Well, even that, that I mean, we have 47 missionaries uh, serving and, and currently and um, with the 85 that are on our team right now. So we we, uh, we know that there's some adjustments that need to be made and um, some missions, depending on, on how long they've served already, will be sent out again, uh, maybe to a, more of a local area, um, probably staying within the country. But uh, again, we're still working with that. We, we've asked all our all our uh, recruits and then our, our return missionaries to be patient with us and, and understanding. And so far they've been great. You know, we've, we've going to keep the line of communication open with them and their families and our, myself and our, our, our assistant coaches. And I have a lot of confidence that we'll get this figured out. It's always a difficult thing um, dealing with missionaries and the numbers, but uh, even now it, 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 it's nothing that we can't overcome. Whoever's running that spreadsheet's got to be really good, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's more than just me doing it too. So yeah. Just... Okay, line eighty nine. So and so's in Italy. Yeah, exactly. Um, was was there any big challenger to Harvey Unga, or was this an obvious choice as the I, running backs coach? I think it was a, a pretty obvious choice from the beginning. But I, I, you know, even though it seemed like the the probably the best decision right away. I think it was important for us to take our time, make sure we do it the right way, and go through the process of the hiring, um, in, the, uh, in the process of hiring. And and uh, luckily, he was given an opportunity to, to run run the room and and run the the you know practices and things like that. And we saw enough from it, and it basically confirmed what we thought and had us give us an opportunity to, to meet with some others and and talk with them and uh, possible candidates and and also. You know, see see the the status of our our position, and then it gave us a chance to look at all the other positions and see if there's any adjustments or things that we need to do uh, to get the best um, assistant hired. And I think with the timing and with everything that was going on, it it all made made a lot of sense. There's a lot of great candidates that could have came in here and done that, done the job well. But uh, I think he's a perfect fit for what we're trying to get to right now and keep that room running. And, and I've been really impressed with Harvey and his teaching. Been around him for pretty much his whole life, you know. And so seeing him uh, doing the things that he did as a player didn't really surprise me at all. And so uh, I think he's got a huge trajectory for what he can accomplish as a, as a coach and looking forward to seeing that and be a part of his career. Your first year as the defensive coordinator at Utah was 09, right? Uh, yes. So your first year is Harvey's <laughs> junior year. Yeah. Was it like defending that guy from the other side? Hey, listen, I committed Harvey when I was at when I was at Utah. Okay, <laughs> and so uh, Lance Reynolds and the rest of them came in and 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 Bronco, and they did a great job at, at convincing him to go there. So uh, uh, and and now I'm glad that he did that. I, but I totally understood, you know, and and I think Lance knew me and. Uh, knew my connection with with BYU, and so I mean it was interesting. Lance told him it, we're in a home visit, and Lance said, "Hey, um, just to, to Harvey, just ask Kalani what he truly feels about BYU." And <laughs> we're in the home visit, and he asked me, and I started tearing up. I'm like, "Oh my gosh, this guy's not coming here!" And, <laughs> and so um, yeah, it was it was a, a really cool experience. But you know, I think recruiting is about helping the young man find the best spot for him, and. And I, I've, I've been around a lot of great recruits and seeing them uh, choose to be on certain schools and, and making sure they have the perfect fit, I think, is really important for me as a, as a coach and, and as, a, as a possible mentor. Micah Simon posted earlier today that he ran a 4 3 5 40, and it was laser-timed among all of his other laser time drills. And they, too, your seniors that are graduating and look to pursue future NFL careers are all in this unprecedented situation trying to get noticed. Um, what what do you say to those guys uh, as they try and prepare to take that next step and do so in what feels like impossible scenarios? I think they know um, that they are important to us, and 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 uh, I can tell you that talking with Tom, uh, Tom Homo, it, the NFL is important for our players, and so he's worked through a bunch of different scenarios, and he's working with our NFL liaison Jason Nayu and and with our DFO, John Swift, and we're working through some things and trying to see what we can do with the NFL scouts to help our players be in a position to get ready for the draft. You know, I think um, 
them doing this and, and it's just showing that what they've been doing this whole time and uh, the speed that, that we see from our guys, it's not surprising to me. And so I just, I wanted them to get out there so they can, the NFL scouts can see this. And, and I think this, uh, when they see the, the numbers and they see how hard these guys have worked throughout the years, I think they'll be really impressed with the progress that they've made since their senior year in high school. Late bloomer for sure, but uh, fun to see him run fast. Okay, Kalani, we appreciate the time. Thanks for coming. You guys are awesome. Go Kooks. Love you guys. Got it, man. That was one of our favorite interviews this week. You're listening to the best of BYU Sports Nation. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. There were no ties this season, Jeremy. And thankfully, can you imagine BYU having to tie at Tennessee? Yuck. No, it went to overtime. And that is part of our BYU Sports Nation best play bracket, the heroics in Knoxville. Now, our crack research team has broken down every play over the past year from BYU football and basketball and come up with the top eight in each of those two sports. Okay? So yeah, yeah, head to head. Let's go. Like two plays, Rams on a, on a mountain. Eight basketball, eight Let's football go. going head to head in a bracket. Yes. Uh, so they were seated one through eight. The top eight in football, top eight in basketball. So like the eight seed in basketball against a one seed in football and so on. So let's walk through the bracket. And here's how you vote, by the way. We're going to start this now. You go to vote.boatv.org and you can vote on one matchup a day. This, this will take us through three weeks here to go weekdays uh, on BYU Sports Nation here. So let's take a look at the bracket, Smith. All right. So the number one seed in the football bracket Not surprisingly, Micah Simon and his catch from Zach Wilson against Tennessee. He's matched up with Zach Selyus' persistent steal. Give me that ball. Transition outlet to Jake Toulson for three against Gonzaga. Next matchup, TJ Haas is the two seed from Hoops, the winner versus Houston at the buzzer beater, and then uh, the seventh seed in football. Chaz Ayu, the strip slash recovery at Toledo. That was a great play mitigated by what happened next, which was uh, an interception returned down to the two-yard line that actually... Uh, injures Zach Wilson's thumb. The number three seed from BYU football, Baylor Romney to Matt Bushman on a double reverse flea flicker trick play against Boise State, taking on TJ Haas, throw it off the back of the defender, inbound play against Virginia Tech in Maui. Then the next one, uh, four seed in hoops, Yoli Childs, the dunk against the Zags, kind of sealed it, right? Just nice play. Uh, and then the five seed in football, Dax Milne, his touchdown catch against USC. What a great catch. Uh, and that's against a five-star cornerback that's, as well. That's a fun matchup, by the way. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's walk-on, former walk-on versus five-star. <laughs> Number one seed from basketball, T.J. Haas, game winner and new St. Mary's face against the Gales to win on February 1st. He's taking on another Dax Milne touchdown catch against USF, a one-hander in South Florida. Those are great, man. Uh, the next matchup, two seed, Diane uh, Gonwoliku's interception against USC to seal the win in overtime. And then the seven seed in basketball, Alex Barcelo's uh, game cinching three against Utah State. Huge. He had made one shot to that point, one for eight, I think, and then yeah. he knocks in that three. It didn't win the game, but it sealed the game, if yeah. you will. Yeah. yeah. The four seed from BYU football. Maybe this is uh, a sleeper here. Tyson Williams, overtime, double overtime for that matter, touchdown with the entire BYU football team parading him into the end zone against that SEC front. Yeah, there was some discussion about that one. Uh-huh taking on T.J. Haas' dunk against St. Mary's to send that game into overtime in Moraga. Yeah, and then the uh, last matchup here, three seed in hoops, T.J. Haas alley-ooped Yoli Childs at San Diego to Woo. win the game. You play to win the game, I'm told. And then six seed in football, Matt Bushman, trick play against Liberty. Touchdown uh, catch from Micah Simon. Okay, those are the 16 plays that go. our crack research team has come up with. I do have a few questions for the committee, uh, Jerem. Like what? First of all, the number one play from football was not a touchdown. I don't disagree one iota with this. Okay. I, this I'm just is bringing it the up. best play of the year I, by I'm far. I'm just bringing it up. It wasn't a scoring play, so does that knock it down a seed line at all, or should it? You say no. No, no. Okay? but Sunday play will knock it down one seed line. <laughs> okay. And then the four seed, Tyson Williams. Is that play under seeded? No, I think four is... A good spot for it. Okay. There was discussion with that one whether it should be on there at all. And one person in the room um, said no. And I was really, uh, I really disagreed with that. I was yeah. not the person that said it. It was absolutely. I, I wouldn't <laughs> it pass to be aggressive you like that. 
I would behind your back <laughs> later, but I wouldn't in front of everyone. <laughs> it needs to be on the list. <laughs> okay, for today's matchup, our first matchup, Pitt's our top-seeded football play, Micah Simon, the uh, miracle play at uh, Tennessee in Knoxville against the eight-seed Zach Selius with the steal against Gonzaga, outlet to Jake Toulson for a long three-pointer. That is the first matchup you can vote on today. How about we watch those? Uh, yes, let, yes let's, please. Let's start yes. with Micah yes. Simon against Tennessee. 50 yards away from field goal territory. A step up by Wilson. Deep man is open. It's caught by Simon. Oh, yeah, He's baby. the 40. The Come 35, back, 30, 30, 25, 20, 50. You got to hustle. Line. You got to hustle. BYU is going to lose that game if they don't have a an unbelievable play. Like the that. Rocky Top Revival against the Tennessee team that won eight games this season. Think about what that play meant, too. If BYU doesn't win that game, then they end up 6-6 six and six in the regular season mm. instead of 7-5. and five. Yeah. Geek, geek, geek. yeah, it changes everything. And, and then the, the, Did they beat USC the following week? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to know, right? Um, and then the second play, Zach Selyus against Gonzaga with Jake Toulson finishing it off. Zags come the other way, down 10. And beneath the basket, bobbling the ball is Woolridge. He's tied up. BYU got a hand on it. Selyus gets oh, it. Oh, took it from him. He stole it away. That's to Kobe Lee. Down four to Jake. Transition triple. Did you see who he hit that over, by the way? Philip Petrusha. WCC player of the year. Oh, yeah. There was so much juice in that play. Yeah, great play. That was such a fun environment. Um, Unbelievable. Yeah, so vote. Go to vote.byutv.org and pick which play you feel is the best play. Voting ends at 9 a.m. Mountain tomorrow. And we'll open the voting for the next matchup. So we'll do one matchup a day. Vote on this. Go to BYT, or vote.boitv.org and vote right now. And right now, uh, Micah Simon's catch up 70 to 30 on the Celia Steel. I'll be shocked if the Simon catch doesn't get to the final. Ooh. I think it's that good. Oh, it was so memorable. Yeah, and we'll see which play is the best play. Because guess what? For the first time in a couple of years, basketball gave us a lot of amazing plays. They've had some good plays, but I mean... Like, T.J. Haas' plays could be by itself on All-timers. this. All-timers. Alley-oop. All-timers. Dunk. St. Mary's. Houston. Like, T.J. Haas is carrying the basketball portion of this in a tremendous way. Yeah. Vote.byutv.org to have your say. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. It is our pleasure to welcome in the head women's golf coach at BYU, Carrie Roberts, one of our favorites. Coach, welcome back to Studio B. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Before the winter and spring sports shutdown, you took a trip to New Zealand with your team, and you were just telling us a story. Danny Ainge, of all people, goes along, him and Brian Santiago, and they have the audacity <laughs> to challenge your team. I tell you what, it, yeah, bring it on, Danny, bring it on. <laughs> he, uh, yeah, so he, I think he first picked Alicia and Anik, uh, two sophomores on our team, our team leaders, and they just destroyed him. Our girls just destroyed him, and he, I think he was so distraught. He's like, "Okay, wait, what just happened? <laughs> that didn't just happen. I need him again." And so he picked him again. Boom, we be- they beat him again, and then he just, I think maybe they played three times because he was just like, "I have to beat him," and. Every time they I mean they just destroyed him. It was great. <laughs> a competitor in Danny yeah. probably comes out exactly. right. Brian's very competitive. Yeah. Exactly. And Danny Ainge just sent a, a message to kind of the coaches kind of boosting us up and he mentioned, you know, he's working on his golf game to beat the women's golf team. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Let, let's talk about how all of this has affected your team because this was a, a young but talented team, just two upperclassmen, um, one senior and an opportunity potentially to come back. We'll see, right? Anna Kennedy, just the one yeah. senior there. Um, ha- how did you find out, first of all, that the season was over? Yeah, so we're on the putting green. I was helping Anik, and we're just chatting. And honestly, we're just watching our phones. You know, Pac-12 pulls out, SEC pulls out. I'm like, wow, this is crazy. And I'm like, I just hope we get through conference. And we're putting, and I'm like, okay, well, what do you want to wear this week? Because we were leaving, I think it was Thursday. We were leaving Sunday for Vegas. We had So the, a Mexico tournament had been canceled because people couldn't travel. So this pop-up tournament in Vegas, we decided to go down. And we're on the punting green. I'm like, hey, what do you want to wear? You know, so we're trying to pick out our outfits. And literally, so practice is over. I get a text, and I'm like, 
season's done and say it was canceled and literally it went from what are we going to wear to our season's over like we're done it was just it was it took a while for it to sink in you know what I mean I had it took honestly a couple of days for me to process like no 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 April's gonna come we're gonna win conference and we're gonna move on you know what I mean it, it just it it still is just kind of like come on yeah, it's, it's not real. It's still weird. It's not real. Yeah. yeah. I'm still expecting the men's volleyball team to play yeah. this week. Win a championship. Yes. Absolutely. Carrie Roberts with us on BYU Sports Nation. How do you coach your team in a shutdown like this? Because golf is an interesting sport. You can still socially distance and isolate and practice if a course yeah. is open. Yeah. But So how do you coach your team in this circumstance? Well, we have, you know, the players went home. Alicia's home in Hawaii. Anik's in Vegas. But we send messages a lot. We've got drills to do. I've got a couple locals that we actually go out and play. Um, you know, we don't touch the flag stick ever. There's no rakes out there. You can keep your distance yeah, from That's a little people. different right now, right? Yeah. yeah, it's totally different. But, I mean, we can still go play. We practice, have drills to do. Um, you know, we stay close. I love social media now because, I mean, think about it. We're just – now we're connected. We can stay connected, right? FaceTime. You can FaceTime. Hey, how, do, what, what, how does this look? Yes. You know? This is so. the most unique and, I guess, best setup technologically to interact during Absolutely. any pandemic yeah. in the history of the world. Yeah, right? the whole team can be on you one You can still communicate. And watching. Yeah, it's awesome. Right. We can be learning what's going on in other countries, right? Totally. When the Spanish flu is ravaging in 1918, yeah. they don't know what's going on yeah. elsewhere, right? So yeah. it's certainly unique that way. My mom brings the flu up all the time. Well, in the flu, in the Spanish flu, you know, they went outside. You got to get your kids outside. Like, okay, well, okay. We'll like, wait, outside. you can't be, you're not that. Oh, wait yeah, I was like, wait, wait a second. Wait a minute. Um, with how many how many scholarships do you have in women's Six. golf again? Six. So we don't know all the details relative to. Okay, it's a spring sport. Yeah. Women's golf ends later. Um, if Anna Kennedy wants to come back, the yeah. NCAA is going to allow her to come back. Um, I guess what questions do you have as a coach relative yeah. to those details? Well, will it affect scholarship minimums? Right. So I mean, that affects everything. We're just literally every decision I think hinges on that. Like what. What are the consequences of people coming back? Can they come back? Will there be limits? Will there not be limits? Meaning more scholarships. Yeah. On a team, given that you'd have seniors. Yeah. Well, if seniors come spots. back, then yeah, it takes away. So we have to make it work somehow, or just get rid of the minimums. Honestly, just get rid of minimums and 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 have as and many, let them come back. Just those seniors would add to your total. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So we have six. Yeah. Right. So you'd so, have seven on scholarship. Potentially, if Anna yeah. can break. Yeah, but those six scholarships, you can break them up. So I, gotcha. I, mean, I can have 24 people on my team if I gotcha. want. Gotcha. That's yeah. what men's volleyball does. Yes. They have a four and a half baseball, yeah. 11.7. Yeah, 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 Okay, yeah. gotcha. But if a senior's coming back and a freshman's coming in, you go over that six. So I can split up six. Does that make sense? Yes. So it all, de- it all deter- you know, NCAA, if they let us have that minimum or not, or if they waive the minimum, kind of determines what seniors will do. Hmm. We just asked Kalani Sataki about his spreadsheet with football and managing all those scholarships. And all those missionaries that just could be coming back. Right? Insane. Out of control. Insane. Out of control. Yeah. Okay, your team was ranked 62nd last I saw out of 261 Division One golf teams, and that's with a young squad. You've been in yeah. the top 25 recently. What's working so well for your team, even having a majority of younger players? Yeah, I love the young. You know, we're young. We, we start two sophomores, one freshman, um, and they're, they're, it's starting to click. You know, and that's where I was just kind of like, no, come on, Corona. You know, like we were starting to play some really good golf. We had a really good fall. And that's what happens with a spring. I mean, a, a young team, right? You're kind of up and down. Like, I mean, our fall third or third round average was like 281. Like, think about that. I mean, I guarantee that's probably the best in the country. And But our first round was probably one of the worst in the country. You know, so it evened out. And then, but we had a lot of positive. Alicia won as a sophomore. You know, we had some really good things going for us. You know, they work hard. They're motivated. And I tell you what, when you get them all on the same page, like working towards the same thing, that's when magic happens. It's awesome. Just put Danny Ainge on the competitive <laughs> side His and uh, let, him, let him go to work. Or something. I sent him that video. I uh, I don't I think it was SportsCenter just posted him making that last second shot or whatever. And I sent it to the girls like, oh, my gosh, whoa. And I was like, yeah, check out the shorts. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Long, yeah. Great stuff. Carrie, it's great to have you in studio. Thanks for having me. Uh, we appreciate your uh, optimism and uh, the hope. Always forward. bring good stories. Yeah, we great. appreciate the it. The vibe is good. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having sure. me. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio.
The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. And we continue on in this new madness of March. And joining us to do so right now is one of our good friends, Yoli Childs, BYU basketball great, joining us via Skype on the Deseret First Credit Union hotline. Yoli, it's uh, great to talk with you. Thanks so much for making this part of your day. And uh, first and foremost, where are you and how are you feeling? No, it's great having me on. I appreciate you guys. Uh, I just got in on the workout over at a good friend, uh, Ricky Norton, his facility. So he's able to get me in here with uh, nobody else in the gym. So we're staying safe and uh, I'm pretty blessed to, to have friends like that. Uh, what, what's life like for you right now as you kind of cope emotionally with it's over and we would have played in March Madness, yet you got your kind of eyes on a pro career that we'll see what happens with sports in general, right? Yeah, it's, it's very different right now. And uh, that's not just for me, but for everybody. This is just a, a very different time. And uh, it's definitely unprecedented. Um, looking back on the season, you know, initially – uh, there's a lot of sadness when it comes to thinking about what could have been and uh, when, when you think about missing out on, on something that you've worked so hard for. But uh, as the days have gone by, uh, I've just been filled with gratitude. It, it was such a fun season and uh, such an amazing group of guys to play with. And the fan base was incredible. Our whole community was coming together over this basketball team. And it was so much fun. And I'm just so grateful for, for every second I had out there. Yoli, you said you wanted to do something special in your return to BYU for a senior season. Now that you've had time to reflect back on what actually did happen, do you feel like you did that? Yeah, I feel like we did. I felt like it was a special season. Uh, I felt like we were able to kind of put BYU back where back where it belongs, you know, uh, back on that uh, national rankings and um, becoming a household name again with the basketball program and I'm just so excited moving forward. Uh, hopefully we can be the team that kind of sparked that and uh, sparked that new era of BYU basketball. And uh, These teams in the future can really make us proud. And uh, I think for that reason, it was special. Take us back to about a year ago. So it's been, you know, two weeks from the WCC tournament, obviously a disappointing finish uh, with the loss San Diego. We're thinking you're gone. Um, then some things happen. Take us uh, back to about a year ago emotionally of, how you figured out that you were going to come back and, and what it took to arrive at that decision. Yeah. Uh, I, I just had a realization uh, about how amazing this university is and how much I love BYU. I think a lot of times when we're in something, we take it for granted and um, going through um, kind of what a senior would go through of uh, that range of emotions of being done and moving forward, I was kind of able to realize how special BYU is to me and how lucky I was to be in the situation I was in. And uh, what really did it for me was I came back to the gym and there was no workouts going on or anything like that, no mandatory workouts. Um, but there were probably seven or eight of our guys in the gym just working out as hard as they could, either with a manager, playing one-on-one, rebounding for each other. And the intensity and the drive they had when it wasn't required, uh, it was so special. And uh, when I looked into those guys' eyes, I was like, this this is a special team, and they deserve to be great. And that was the big thing for me. Obviously, I wanted to improve my draft stock. I wanted to do those things. But the biggest thing was I saw a group of guys that deserved to do something special, and I wanted to sacrifice everything I could to help them do that uh, because they deserved it. Yoli Childs with us on BYU Sports Nation. The NBA draft is now in a very fluid circumstance, as is all of sports nationally. Um, you said you're working out day to day where you can Norton performance, things like that. But do you expect the NBA draft to go off when it is? And if not, uh, what do you do in the meantime? I have no idea what to expect. Uh, I don't think many people do know what's going on, um, but I'm just having faith. You know, that's what we can do in times like this. And, you know, it, it's really different. It's unprecedented. And uh, who knows if the draft's going to be later on time. Uh, if the NBA is going to resume, nobody really knows. Um, but what I do know is there's a plan greater than my plan. There's a plan greater than all of our plans, and I have faith in that plan. And I'm going to do everything in my power to continue to work, get better at the game I love, become a better person. Um, and I feel that if I do that every single day, uh, God will put me where I need to be. 
And you've said out loud you want that to be in the NBA, right? And uh, that's the hope. Last year at this time, you weren't projected to be in the draft per se. Do you feel like you've climbed into the top 60? Yeah, I do. Um, hearing feedback from teams, uh, there's a lot of teams really interested, especially in that second round. And uh, I'll just be trying to do everything in my power to to move up, to show these teams what I'm capable of, show them my commitment, um, and do everything I can to to be in one of those spots. Yoli, you outlined the things that pro scouts were telling you to work on last spring, and obviously a lot of those came to fruition on the court. You had an amazing season, averaged over 22 points and nine rebounds a game, and uh, despite only playing in a limited number of games, you were able to make a mark. So what are pro scouts telling you now about what you need to improve on? Uh, I haven't gone into too much detail with that, um, but I do know that I've improved on some of the things that they wanted to see, and I think I've shown that I'm a player that's going to improve year to year. I'm going to be a better player going into next season than I was this season. Um, I'm going to continue to do that as long as possible. And uh, I think some teams are seeing that. And, uh, you know, I just hope for the best and keep working. Let's talk about two simulations uh, that were in BYU's favor that uh, were fun. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the freshest one is Joe Lenardi Saturday saying that uh, BYU beats Seton Hall on a 40-foot buzzer beater. By Jake Did you Toulson. guys see that shot Jake hit, man? <laughs> it was amazing, right? Incredible, right? That might have been the greatest shot in the history of BYU. Just <laughs> ice in his veins. Shout out to Jake Toulson, man. Great shot. Unbelievable. Now, now, TJ had been the buzzer beater guy, right? He had been the big shot guy. So was he double teamed on that play? Is that why Jake got the ball? Or <laughs> did you did, not, was it Jake's did you play? Not see it? Well, I was it's watching been, Jake. I didn't see, I didn't see the yeah. replay, yeah. Yeah, so TJ was doubled. Uh, I said a great back pick for Jake. I thought we should have thrown it to me, but we actually threw it over the top to Jake, and uh, he launched it with two guys on him. Really selfish play, but uh, <laughs> it, it went down, and, you know, the rest is history. Who it, inbounded it again? <laughs> it was uh, Alex Barcelo. Alex did. You know, he's so short that – he had the trajectory over the seven-footer that was on him. It was awesome. The Russell Wilson yeah. deep pass. Yeah, yeah I okay, So Barcelo awesome. on the inbound. Hey, I don't, I don't blame you for feeling you got slided, Yoli. You're shooting yeah. almost 50% from the three-point line. Why shouldn't you take that shot? I'm clearly a better three-point shooter than Jake. <laughs> Look at the numbers. I mean. <laughs> what, um, and who was the fifth guy on the court again? I can't remember. Zach Selyus? Oh, it was, a, it was Gavin. He was, oh, it was Gavin. Uh, he was okay. under the rim. They just a, a tip. Or court lob. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, he was just a diversion. Gotcha. Next, yeah. year, though, I, next I, year, they'll throw it. To I appreciate you filling in the details. I there can't for wait that. for us to uh, manipulate this somehow. We, <laughs> we got a Lego guy. We got a Lego guy. We know a guy. That yeah. we do. Yeah. Yoli Childs with us on BYU Sports Nation. Yoli, what's your typical day like when you wake up to the time you go to bed right now with social distancing in play? Uh, just a lot of time at home with my family. Um, I'm doing what I can to, to get my workouts in, uh, working out at home. Uh, got some free weights, doing that type of thing. Um, I'll head to the gym. It's about a 30-minute drive, and I'll just get in here by myself or uh, with one person rebounding for me. Uh, and obviously, we're washing our hands, doing all that stuff, staying away from each other. But uh, So I, I got about two hours there of working out, but most of the day is just hanging out, doing homework, hanging out with my wife, watching movies with the family. So uh, it's definitely a weird time, but there's a lot of good that comes out of it, a lot of good in spending time with our families. Yoli, are you a video game guy, a board game guy, Netflix guy, watch old BYU games guy? Where, where do you fall in that, uh, I guess, genre? I'm anything competitive, I'm in. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not a huge video game guy, but I love board games, cards, that type of stuff. So I love to get competitive. I've been working on not getting too competitive, though. My wife gets mad at me when I, when I get too crazy, <laughs> throw the board. But uh, I, I get pretty competitive. Uh, I think it's pretty fun. Listen, Megan's a competitor, too, right? She played college she volleyball. Is. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, uh, what board games are you playing right now? So we've been on Farkle lately. You ever heard of that? Yes, it's fantastic. Di- dice, right? Yeah, my, my wife and my mother-in-law, they're like the Farkle queens. They're so good. I don't know. It's is that a thing you want to say a lot? Dude, it's like it's supposed to be a game of luck, but I don't know. I, I don't know if they if they flipping the dice when we're not looking, but they're so good. 
Yeah, they're telling you not to be competitive when maybe you're you're alluding to you know potential uh, tampering here. Yeah, right? they've got Ocean's Eleven waiting the oh, dice. Yeah, yeah and, wait a it's, minute. Uh, it's it's something. They're 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 doing something together. I don't know. Uh, Yoli, it's great to talk with you, man. We are super excited for your basketball future, and we know the uncertainty is is unsettling and. Uh, we feel it right along with you, but uh, we can't thank you enough for the time, and it's so fun to watch you come back to BYU and, and do great things, and we're excited to follow your pro career, man. I appreciate you guys. Everybody watching, have faith. We're going to get through these tough times together. That's how we're going to do it, and uh, things will be normal sooner than later. So I appreciate all you guys, and appreciate you having me on. Well said, my friend. We'll talk to you soon. Yoli Childs on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline via Skype. Deseret First, you know why we show how. Farkle. Have you played Farkle? I have not it's played a, It's Farkle. a dice game. I can't remember the rules, but, yeah, it's, the name's weird. You know, it's, it's fun. <laughs> I have played Spot It with my kids, like, an uncountable number of times. I don't think I know that one. Spot It, okay. That's a fun game. Uh, we've also played The Floor is Lava, which yeah, is, a, which is that's an interesting a, a game. That's a classic. Okay. Uh, played a lot of video games. I'm learning Minecraft. From my yeah, my daughter likes Minecraft too, but I don't really know it. Yeah, yeah. I, I've I guess been he's eight a, now. Sorry, Jack. I've right. been re- I've been reading a Shea Serrano book, basketball and other things. It's amazing. It's so good. That's my uh, that's my recommendation. Okay. Yeah. Reading? What is what is that? Yeah. No, I, I like to read what, what when it's out that? of season. <laughs> the best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. We have a BYU Sports Nation best play of 2020 bracket specific to football and basketball. The top eight plays in each side going head to head to find out what you, BYU Sports Nation, think is the greatest play of the 2019-2020 season. Yeah, with football and men's hoops, uh, top 16 plays, as you mentioned, top eight football and basketball. We had our first matchup yesterday. You can go and vote. Every day, uh, each weekday, on vote.boatv.org, and we will announce the results, including the winner from yesterday. So let's go there. Yeah, Micah Simon's 64-yard catch against Tennessee, the Rocky Top revival against Zach Selyus's steal on the baseline outlet to Jake Toulson for three in that memorable game against number two ranked Gonzaga. And the final tally is 76% choose the Micah Simon 64 yard catch. Not surprising. It's one of our top seeds, if not the top seed, knocking off Celius and Toulson. That was a 1v8. So uh, understandable on that. It's a great play from uh, Zach Seljus and Jacob Toulson, uh, but alas. Mike Simon, on the, on the day he announced he ran a 4-3-5. Here's a look at the overall bracket. Uh, if you have a microscope, you can uh, check it out. And, and uh, Simon moves on. Not, un- not unexpected. I expect Simon to be in the final. All right, Micah Simon moving on. What about today's matchup, Jerem? Okay, let's talk about it. The number two seed on the hoop side of the bracket is TJ Haas hitting the game winner on November 15th at Houston. Inbounds to Haas. With three seconds, Haas pulls up, fades away. Yes, he goes! TJ Haas! It's hard not in that moment to be in this register! Oh, incredible. It was so exciting. So exciting. Shep on the call there with Mark Durant. Mark Durant's arms raised. The hug from TJ who just turns, and there's Mark. <laughs> Poor Jason's, like, separated. He's not part of the... Uh... Hugging process. <laughs> that was the initial first real special domino to fall this yes. season. Where it's like, oh, this team has something. They yeah. have something. Yeah, it was like, oh, wow. That was, I, and that game was on, uh, like, I watched that on Watch ESPN and, like, on the app, it was delayed. I'm all nervous. Twitter's ahead. You know, it was crazy. Outstanding. All right. TJ's buzzer beater at Houston goes head to head with the seven seed on the football side. This is an incredible play by Chaz Ayu that really, I think, should have won the game for BYU against Toledo. Watch this. Late in the play clock they go with five on the play clock to give to Kobach. Kobach gets to the second level and has another first down for Toledo to the 20. Ball comes loose and the Cougars have it. Cougar football! The Cougars have it! They knock it loose and recover. Chaz Ayu with just a man play rips the ball out mid-run from Toledo's running back 
and gives BYU a chance to win the game. It happened so fast, it was hard to know that it wasn't actually knocked out. It was just taken away. It was Zach Selyus away. Chaz Ayu pulled... Uh, no, Zach Selyus pulled the Chaz Ayu. So go to vote.buatv.org and vote on these two plays. The Haas game winner at Houston against the Chaz Ayu strip recovery. Listen, there are seeds. We've thought about this hard. It's going to be hard for uh, Chaz Ayu's play to take down TJ Haas, but who knows, man? Who knows? So vote. We'll tell you the winner on tomorrow's show. Okay, now as promised, the next matchup in the BYUSN Best Play of the Season bracket presented by doTERRA. A friendly reminder of how this works. Our very hardworking selection committee found the top eight plays from BYU football last season and the top eight plays from BYU basketball season. And we are pitting them against each other in bracket fun to find out the best play of the athletic year for BYU. Go to vote.byutv.org and cast your vote each day. Polls close at 11 a.m. Eastern time, and we'll announce the results during BYU Sports Nation. In fact, right now, let's do that. All right, first item of business within this bracket fun. Let's see which play you decided should move on to the next round from yesterday. Number two seed T.J. Haas and his game winner at Houston, not surprisingly, in a landslide, takes out Chaz Ayu as the seventh seed in his strip recovery at Toledo. The game winner moving on 91% of that vote for T.J. Haas at Houston. Yeah, no shock there. All right. So for those bracket buster enthusiasts at home that are following along, TJ's game winner will move on to face the winner of tomorrow's matchup between Yoli's dunk against Gonzaga and Dax Milne's touchdown catch against USC. Now for today's matchup on the screen, uh, the football three seed is a Matt Bushman TD catch from a reverse flea flicker from Baylor Romney, putting BYU up 28-10 against Boise State. It's a handoff to Katoa. It's a give to Hefo. It's a flea flicker and a throw to Bushman. It's complete and another touchdown! 39 yard score on the reverse flea flicker. I love BYU Great. beating Boise State. Yeah, and was that even hard? It was the third string quarterback for BYU and the fifth string running back. Was it even hard to beat 14th ranked Boise State? <laughs> That play squares off against a game that was re-aired on ESPN just a night or two ago. BYU basketball against Virginia Tech. The six-seed T.J. Haas here getting fancy off an inbounds play at the Maui invite against the Hokies and scoring a memorable and one. We'll enter it off the backside of and the Hokies. Oh! That was awesome. He bounced it <laughs> off of Jalen Cohn's backside and lays it up and in with the foul for the 50-48 to 48 <laughs> lead and a chance for a three-point play. Oh, Mark Durant move. I nope. did that once. No one's more excited about it than Mark Durant. <laughs> and when you get really excited, you get into this register. We have established that, right? Cast your vote now by going to vote.byutv.org right now. The Bushman Flea Flicker uh, with essentially a 4-1 to one lead uh, about 80 percent to tj has 20 percent yeah i'll be surprised if uh, the bushman flea flicker doesn't win because BYU fans love a, a win versus a rival right um and boise state being ranked in the top 15 that baylor romney's right arm cost boise state millions of dollars it just did and it's just delicious yes just it is all love oh. the taste of that win oh my goodness that play yes. by tj yeah was incredible and uh just that that was just the taste speaking of of this team, and when they beat Virginia Tech, I was like, oh, okay. He was pretty good. Uh-huh. This is awesome. Jeremy, as we discussed yesterday in reference to Baylor Romney, Ty Detmer is just a poor man's Baylor Romney. <laughs> as an OC or a player? <laughs> which one? I kid, I which, kid. Which one are we talking about? <laughs> we love the Ties one. Come on. The best of BYU Sports Nation. We'll be right back. Rise and shout for the trending topics of the week here on the best of BYU Sports Nation. Last night, BYU basketball put out a three-minute highlight video of the season set to the great Luther Vandross's one shining moment. The ball is tip. <laughs> Look, normally we don't get to hear that song until right after the national champion is crowned, but because of this year's circumstances, we're not going to get that chance. So Watching the video last night, it was it was all of these things. It was emotional, it was exciting, and kind of heartbreaking all in one because we never got to see what this Cougar team could do in the postseason. What's your one shining moment for this year's BYU basketball team? This is a, on uh, Major League Baseball opening day, if you will. This is a 3-0 count. I'm expecting a fastball, <laughs> and I'm going to crush this over the center field fence. Um, 
it's beating number two Gonzaga at home. It's it's I can't see really an argument against that. That was such an incredible experience, and it was so unbelievable for the game itself, and for the lead up, and for the payoff. Let's break it all down. So leading up to it, the anticipation. I believe that the basketball team carried a little bit of um, unfulfilled excitement from the football season a little bit. That this was a team that, okay, seven and six football, we were all hoping it'd be kind of eight or nine, right? Disappointing finish in the Hawaii Bowl. So the basketball team was good and better than we thought and, and got it to the top 25 for the first time in nine years. We do a BYU Sports Nation in the Marriott Center. It's senior night for seven dudes, including three all-timers in Childs, Haas, and Toulson. Um, the Rock showed up unbelievably. Like, they were so good. And BYU paid that game off. Remember in 2011, BYU storms the court for the first time ever? There wasn't what happened on after the Gonzaga game in this, which was everyone lingered. and Longer. And, 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 yes, exactly. And there were cheap drinks, you know, like Sprite with random juices. Mm. No, Sprite Jake Toulson and Yoli Childs and TJ Haas grabbed the mic and they ta- and Mark Pope, they all talked. That didn't happen, right? There right. was this, let's just sit here and enjoy this yeah. and soak this up moment that wasn't had even with Jim Fredette and Jackson Emery. It's clearly Gonzaga, but there were many amazing moments in this, and uh, it was fun to see that video. I went through a range of emotions, yeah. by the way, that was weird. Uh, like you said, I also went, in, I went through the stages of grief <laughs> in the video <laughs> of sad and then mad and angry and then, you know, resolution and... It was it was exciting to watch. It was also hard to watch. I'm not over that this is over. And nor nor should anybody be. This it's this should still be going on. BYU legitimately could still be playing and should be playing. We should be talking to Spencer live from LA today. That's what we <laughs> would have been doing. That's what we yeah, would have been doing. You're right. Look, I I you and I are on the same page with this. And I guess if you look at one shining moment, I guess a lot of that could be how you interpret that. Is it is it literally a moment in the season? Is it a game? Is it an experience? Is it one shot? Is it the same moment? But but I mean yes one. But I think you can interpret that different ways. Like a moment could be a shot. Is this a Nicene Creed? No, but look, ooh, Creed. No, I'm not going <laughs> to sing. Step, what? I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> but yes, when you look at this season, there is one moment that stands out beyond all others, and that's beating number two Gonzaga. It was it was the build up. Because that game was built up forever. The hype, you had people camping out. You talked about doing the shows. And you knew that the atmosphere was going to be electric. So beyond just the buildup, then the game lived up to the hype. Then you had BYU winning. You had all of the things that happened afterwards. And Mark Pope in the locker room and doing... It, Cubbies. And yeah, the it, was, yeah, it was unbelievable. There, there is no doubt that the signature win of the season was beating Gonzaga. Now, if there's a certain play that maybe you're going to go, that is your moment? Let me guess for you. Well, I'm saying T.J. Hawes may be one against St. Mary's. Sure. But, yes, the moment you that, were, I, you will, were courtside I, that I will personally baby. remember for yeah. me is, the, is T.J.'s win at Houston because I was right center, there. Bro. I was awesome. right there. I got to call that game. So that's the moment for me. You didn't get hugged, though, let's be honest. I, did, I was still on the air doing stuff. Mark was the one. So that, was Mark. So Mark, <laughs> Mark was being You can hear Mark. Yeah. So, so in terms of the play and the moment that I will personally remember, yeah. it's the shot in Houston by TJ. Does it have a name to you? The shot. The shot? Yeah. Because it's just to me. If I say the shot to myself, I know what I'm talking about. Why are you talking to yourself? Yeah, well, it's, it's the inner monologue. <laughs> but, it, but in terms of the one shining moment for this season, without question, it's beating Gonzaga. Yeah, I, I was hoping that wouldn't be the peak. I was hoping there'd be a second-round win against Seton Hall that we'd think, oh, that was awesome, or some Sweet 16 win. Wow, BYU's in the Elite Eight for just the second time in program history. First time in a 64-plus team field, by the way. When Danny Ainge and company go to the Elite Eight in 81, it's a 48-team field. They still had to win, you know, three games to get there. But it's a, it's a different setup. This would have been... You could argue the best team in BYU history if they make a run to the Elite Eight. We could have a fun conversation there. Um, but, yeah, it's, we still have to figure out where this team lands, by the way. In we BYU know history. that we have, they went we to the national to championship there. game. Oh, my gosh. It, both Yoli Childs and TJ Haas have told us uh, on the show and off, I'm, I'm disappointed we lost that game. They never even played it. <laughs> right. like, awesome. As Jason mentioned a moment ago, yesterday New Orleans 
Saints head coach Sean Payton told WWL Radio, Taysom Hill has earned the opportunity to be the backup quarterback to Drew Brees and will continue to play his utility role as well. Jason, is this the perfect situation for Taysom Hill this year in the NFL? Yeah, it's as perfect as it's going to be for Taysom with Drew Brees coming back. Obviously, the perfect scenario is he's New Orleans starting quarterback, but once Drew decided he was going to come back, sign the two-year deal. This is as good as it could possibly get for Drew Brees in New Orleans. And the whole situation, if you think about it with the Saints, it is geared toward Taysom having success. Number one, he's one play away from being the starter. If something How were, dare you? I'm just saying, if something were to happen, we saw last year with Drew Brees with the, with the thumb. Yep. It was the thumb, right? Oh, torn ligament. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I couldn't remember if it was the thumb or the finger. But Trust yeah, the me, I remember because Teddy Bridgewater beat the <laughs> Seahawks. In yeah, Seattle. and then Teddy Bridgewater goes 5-0 and and milked that into a really nice contract with the Panthers. But he's one Colin play. Colin Cowherd just learned that. <laughs> yes, exactly. If you haven't seen that, it's actually pretty funny. So he's one play away from being the starter, but yet he's also going to be on the field in so many different ways to be a playmaker. It's, it's, a, it's a perfect situation. And last year, if you think about it, and we talked about this, there was a lot of talk about Taysom and – like because of his role and the way they used him, do you really want him being the backup? Because if you're the backup, maybe you take some of those, those things away because you don't want to get him hurt knowing he is one play away. It seems like they've kind of just pushed that aside. It's like we're going to make him the backup, and we're, it's, it's a perfect scenario for him. And let's be honest, if you're going to have Taysom on your roster, and if you're going to start taking things away from what he does, he's not going to have the impact that we've seen. So I think it really is. It's a great scenario for him that he is that close to being the starting quarterback, and they're still going to utilize him. You heard him as a receiver. Everything we've seen, receiver, special teams, tight end, running back, quarterback, all of it, we've seen what he can do, and and I think it's going to be ramped up even more. Everyone who has a job should want a manager or boss like Sean Payne. Yeah. Because he doesn't pigeonhole Taysom Hill into quarterback and just sit on the practice squad. He said, how can I use this guy in an effective way? and maximize his strengths to our business. And that's what they do with Taysom Hill. Everyone should want to be like Taysom Hill in that if you do something really well and someone sees it in your organization, they use it. They don't say, well, tradition or current workflow or politics govern that I can't do. No, Taysom Hill is being being used in a very unique way. And you're exactly right. All the things you said. The perfect situation is that Taysom Hill is a starter. So, no. But, like you said, under the current situation with the two-year deal to Drew Brees, now Taysom Hill is formally being given on March 25th the number two spot opportunity. Of course, if Taysom goes in and struggles, he's not going to automatically be the two. But he's going to earn it. He'll be the two going into the fall. And like you said, he is one play away. Um, he's being used in such a unique situation. It is awesome just to see this athlete go into the league and have an impact for a good team. Yeah. It's, not like the, it's not like the Saints stink and he's still on the team, although we would celebrate him being successful regardless. It's that he's on a team that is good and has had success the last couple of years and was a play away, uh, perhaps from the Super Bowl, right, before all of that um, interesting uh, situation with the refs and whatnot happened. But I'm, I'm with you. By the way, yeah, the deadline for a restricted free agent to sign offer sheets uh, is April 17th. And then there are subsequent other dates that come into play. But we've got a couple weeks here to see if anyone nibbles on Taysom Hill as an RFA. I don't anticipate he will. Perhaps Brady Papinga thinks otherwise. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Look, you know you've arrived when people are trying to imitate what you do. We've heard this, and I think we heard it a couple Who's of, actually doing it, though? No one's no, actually but, doing it. But what it. I'm saying is... They're just talking about you, it. Imitation is the greatest form of flattery. And you've had, over the last, especially last year, I've heard it more last year, but even a little bit before, you had teams, you would read articles about certain teams needing to go out and find their Taysom Hill. <laughs> what? He's nowhere to be found. He's the only that's, one like That's him. what I'm saying. And so the fact that New, that New Orleans has him... They're going to lock him up long term and that they have a vision for what they want him to be. It, it is it is the perfect scenario for Taysom under the current circumstances. Weezer has a song called Perfect Situation. So perhaps that applies to this. I did want to mention this. Taysom's a smart dude, too. I think he can handle being QB2 and all the intellect and play calling associated with that. Yeah. And do this. Remember where he was going to go out of college? Stanford. Yeah. The he, dude is He handled being QB3. Smart. Right. Of course, yeah. But QB3 is nowhere near uh, what QB2 is to me where you could actually play. QB3, it's like, I'm just happy to be here. Yeah, well, that's true.
ESPN Elite, Joe Lunardi, the worldwide leader's resident bracketologist, reveals another BYU upset in his 2020 NCAA Twitter tournament. The Cougars oust San Diego State in a hypothetical Sweet 16 contest in Los Angeles to reach their first Elite Eight, as Jason just mentioned, since 1981. Rejoice, BYU fans! Or maybe this hypothetical madness just makes you sad. Either way, we're going there. And Lenardi isn't the only one to put BYU in that elite company. Pat Forty of Yahoo Sports announced earlier this week BYU was an elite eight team in his mock simulation. Needless to say, the Cougars had the national analyst's attention. Jason, it has prompted this question. Is the 2020 version of BYU basketball as good as the 1981 BYU team that actually qualified for an Elite Eight. This is an interesting conversation, but one that I'm not sure is fair. I'm not sure it's fair to compare these two teams. And the reason I say that is one team had a chance to prove it on the court while the other team didn't. And here's why I be- what I believe about this year's basketball team. They were good enough to make this season memorable. They were good enough to make noise in the NCAA tournament, and they were good enough to do something special. That's what I truly believe about this team. Exactly what that means or how far they would have gone, we will never know because the opportunity was taken away from them. And I don't think it's fair to this year's team to put a limit on on what they could have done because they were never given the chance to actually prove it on the court. Plus, I don't know if it's fair to the 81 team because they did get to prove it, and we know how good they were. This year's team could have done big things. I just wish they had been able to show everybody on the court. It hurts, right? It hurts. And we're looking at all these simulations and thinking, oh, man, BYU basketball just knocked off Seton Hall in the round of 32, and they just beat San Diego State in a vengeance match, and now they got a rematch with Gonzaga and the Elite Eight. We look at the 81 team, and they actually did it. Yeah. They, they beat Princeton, and then they knocked off a two-seed in UCLA, and then they beat another team they were supposed to lose to Notre Dame in the Sweet 16 at the Omni in Atlanta before losing to Ralph Sampson in Virginia. And Ralph Sampson was a world beater when he was playing in college. So it's really difficult because the game has evolved so wildly in the last four decades. Interestingly enough, however, these teams do have a few similarities, 2020 BYU basketball and 81 BYU basketball, including our stat of the day. It's the BYU Sports Nation stat of the day. The last BYU basketball team to make it to the Elite Eight was also a six seed. Interesting. 2020 BYU basketball was projected to be a six seed in most major bracketologist tournaments. So there's that similarity. Jason, I have to ask myself, which of these teams would win a head-to-head matchup? And I lean toward... The 2020 squad winning a close game. I know. I know. I can hear it now. Recency bias, Spencer. You weren't even born when Danny Ainge was the player of the year. It's borderline blast night. You know what? I'm not saying that this year's squad's accomplishments are greater because they're not. And we'll never really know what they could have become. But head to head, I like this year's squad in a close game. Danny Ainge is the GOAT. He's the best player from either side. But I like the idea of Yoli Childs matched up with Greg Kite and Fred Roberts and Jake Toulson is a guy that's accurate from 30 feet. Plus the physicality and training and how the game has evolved in almost 40 years is just so different. Don't get me wrong. The 1981 team is the greatest team with the greatest accomplishments in BYU basketball history. And they produced the greatest moment in Cougar Hoops history with Danny Ainge going coast to coast against Notre Dame at the buzzer to send the Cougars to the Elite Eight. But strictly from a head-to-head perspective, if you played the game and just had these guys going five on five, I like the 2020 squad in a close game. See, when I look at this 2020 team, like I said, this team was built for this time of year. And I think big things were in front of this year's squad. Now, again, we're never going to know. But when you look at the way this team is built and the strengths that it brought to the court, when you look at teams that have success, BYU is built like that. They have, the, they have scores all over the floor. It's not just one guy. They're not just reliant on one or two guys. They've got three guys, 
four guys legitimately that can hurt you, but they stretch the floor. They shoot the ball at an unbelievable clip. Those are the teams in these scenarios that have success. That's why in this scenario with this year's team, with the field they would have faced, I think big things were possible for this team. Unfortunately, they did not get the opportunity to prove it. That's, that is what is so sad about this, is this team was so good, but, but we just will never know how good because the opportunity to prove it was taken away from them. Knowing what we know, and given the shortened season, this is a top five team for BYU basketball without Oh, without question. question. Without question. Probably top three. Seriously. Like, I know the 1987-88 team that started 19-0 and before losing to Alabama-Birmingham I, with Mike Smith. That team was awesome. <laughs> this year's squad yeah. was special with Yoli Childs. They were something else. They only lost twice with Yoli in the lineup. And they were uber motivated to do something special in March. Yeah, the urgency was real. So, a fun conversation. Unfortunately, we'll never know. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Hear are what the coaches, athletes, and experts have to say. Here's another great interview from the week on the best of BYU Sports Nation. Speaking of recency, oh, Jason, yeah. the Kansas City Chiefs just won a Super Bowl in February. Doesn't want- it? Is it, does it feel real? I've watched the game at least 30 times. In fact, I watched the last eight minutes again yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> of course you did. Yes, Daniel Sorensen, a member of the Kansas City Chiefs, joins us now on the Deseret First Credit Union hotline to discuss Super Bowl celebration to sports shutdown. Uh, Danny, the last time the three of us talked together, we were in a locker room in Denver celebrating a Chiefs win over the Broncos. Um, it's, it's been a while, but how are you? Doing great, yeah. Good to have you guys um, or talk with you guys today. Obviously, Jason's very excited about the Super Bowl still, and he's watched it 30 times. How many times have you relived, relived the game or rewatched the game? Uh, I actually haven't watched the game. Really? Sorry, do yeah. you not do that yeah, in general, I... or is just it just you've had other things to occupy your time since? Um, yeah, like, you know, I think – Whatever, you know, the end of the game and last game of the season, I just kind of I move on. Right. Win or lose. You know, this time, gladly we won the Super Bowl, but it, it's it was great and everything. But it was time to move on, time to move on to the off season and, um, you know, into that stage of of my life. Danny, don't don't worry. I have watched it enough for the both of us. Trust me. I, I have okay. literally watched it 30 times at least. So I've got I've got yeah. us both covered. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, Jason's also sent notes to your coaches, so uh, beware, beware of that. <laughs> no, I have not. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, Danny, how has your life changed the most uh, since winning a Super Bowl? Um, you know, I don't think it's changed all that much. I think uh, my attitude, obviously, it's it's better going into the off season, not ending your season on a loss. Um, so it's been happy. It's been joyful. Um, it's been an enjoyable off season. Um, but yeah, you know, other than that, I don't know it's too much is changed. What does it mean to the legacy of Andy Reid in Kansas City? Everything. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think everybody's kind of placed um, winning a Super Bowl on you know, whether how your legacy will be remembered. Um, he's a great coach, whether, you know, we won that last Super Bowl or not, he's going to be go down as one of the greatest coaches of all time. Um, but for, for him to get that and, um, you know, to be a part of that was something special. I know that when you're in the middle of an NFL season, there's so much preparation. You're so laser focused on the task at hand. How much or how often do you and Coach Reed get to talk about BYU football? How how often are the Cougars brought up between you two? Um, you know, yeah, we're we're both pretty busy. You know, um, you know, I've got my film study and practice to work on. He's you know obviously the head coach, and so. Um, you know, it, it, he might walk by and give me a, a little, you know, uh, poke or something or, or say, hey, did you see the game or things like that. But, yeah, I mean, it, he'll bring it up and we chat about it. 
Uh, Daniel, you're obviously very busy. And we, sp- when we were talking in the locker room in Denver, we were talking about life with three kids and being a traveling man in the NFL. How are you balancing all of that right now? Uh, do our best. You know, I think everybody's in a situation where you're, you're home together as a family, um, which is, it's just great. Honestly, we get, I get to spend a ton of time with the kids. Um, no other distractions really. Uh, but yeah, I know it it's definitely busy. It's a full-time gig. Um, I understand now how challenging it is for my wife to do it all by herself during the season. <laughs> she's, she's gladly, um, uh, that I'm I'm home with her now and, and can help <laughs> out, but I'm learning the ins and outs of, of being a full-time parent. What have you been occupying your time with? I see some of the Instagram videos in terms of working out and some things like that, but with, with all of us kind of doing our best to stay inside and, and the quarantine and everything, what, what, are you, what are you doing to occupy your time? Yeah, I try and, I try and uh, still maintain some level of fitness. I've got a little basement gym that I've got um, some dumbbells and things to work out in. And, um, but other than that, it's, it's trying to do some school with the kids um, each day so they're learning still. And then if there's nice weather, um, which we've had um, a fair share of, uh, we get out. We get on walks. We ride our bikes. Um, and we try and get out and enjoy the, the nice weather here. But... No, it's 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 a you know you have to plan for it every day. So, yeah. Daniel Swanson with us on BYU Sports Nation Super Bowl champion BYU football great and now a member of the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, Daniel, when you look at your future as a football player, um, how much longer do you want to keep doing this? Uh, because we're seeing this trend of players that. You know, they'll, they're, they're not as keen to stick around for as long of a time based on just the traumatic injuries and, and how physical football is. So how long do you see yourself playing football? Um, as long as I still love it, and I'm still loving it right now. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to keep doing it until, you know, that, that passion isn't there anymore. And I think, I think you'll know. I don't, I don't, um, I don't know when that will be. I, I, you know, as of right now, I'd play as long as I could, right? Uh, maybe until they kick you out. So maybe whichever comes first, whether somebody says you're done or uh, whether, um, you know, you kind of uh, lose that passion and, and and find something else. You know, for BYU fans watching the NFL, you know, it's it's gotten even more interesting. Obviously, you with the Chiefs and winning the Super Bowl, but Taysom with the Saints, and, and he's obviously going to get a nice contract this offseason. KVN uh, now moving to uh, to Miami, signed a nice deal. Fred Warner with the Niners, a great young team. Jamal, others. What's it like to see so many former BYU Cougars playing prominent roles in the National Football League? It's awesome. These are all guys that I played with. Um... And it's it's fun to to watch them succeed. You know, I'll I'll uh, try and catch their highlights um, after after a game. And you know, if we're not playing um, them, if they're not on the other sideline, I'm rooting for them, cheering for them, and, and hoping that they're doing well. What have you heard from the Kansas City Chiefs and the NFL in terms of protocols and what they want you to do during this very very unique time? as you wait for what you hope is a normal start to the football season? Yeah, I think a lot of that's still up in the air. I think, um, you know, we'll kind of evaluate as things go on as far as, you know, whether we'll have OTAs or or some type of uh, modified um, offseason. But I think think training's a big part of it, and I think it can be difficult um, to try and stay in shape, not having the same resources available. and but I think um, you know I think you try and you try and take advantage of the opportunity to kind of just have a lot of family time, kind of uh, decompress from the season. That's kind of what the off season's for. Get yourself mentally, physically, emotionally kind of um, recovered. And then when it does come time um, to get back to training, uh, whether that's uh, training camp, then then you're ready to go. And um, and then hopefully we can continue uh like a normal like a normal season we've had a lot of byu coaches and players on in the last couple of weeks and and one of the things that we've asked them about was just communication how much time do you spend contacting if you're if you're a coach contacting your players and staying in touch from a from the professional side of things how how much contact are you having with the chiefs or with the nfl how much communication is there between the two sides 
Um, so, so in the, in any typical off season, I don't know if there's a whole lot of communication. It's it's kind of they have their time, players um, have their own time. Um, but uh, our, um, you know, my coach, we've got a, a group chat with the with the defensive back group, and and uh, he checks in on us uh, regularly and and just kind of sends messages, you know, kind of keep our spirits up and kind of let let us know what's going on. Uh, but honestly, typically, it, there's not a whole lot of communication. It's it's your time off, your time with your family, and then when we get back to work, that's that's when we um, get things going. Daniel, I need to give you your due credit before uh, we say goodbye to you, uh, and that for showing up at another huge BYU basketball game and bringing the Dirty <laughs> Dan Karma to the Marriott Center <laughs> for that win over Gonzaga. Right. Uh, when you show up, good things happen for BYU basketball. So can we uh, try and make that happen a few more times next season? Yeah, just get me some season tickets, maybe on the court side and uh, a <laughs> bag of popcorn or whatever, and <laughs> we'll call it a deal. Uh, I'd love to get your take on that atmosphere. What'd you think about that senior night for BYU basketball? Oh, it was unbelievable. Um, and it, it was fun for me. I'm usually, um, you know, a player, um, you know, focused on the game, but, but for me being a fan and a spectator to experience an environment like that was, was really something special. It was awesome. Um, very comparable to any, you know, um, NFL High level, um, you know, competition. It was it was a great atmosphere and a great win, and uh, it was fun to be there with with my family. Yeah, and that uh, means something coming from a guy who plays at Arrowhead Stadium, where uh, the volume is, right. is is next level. <laughs> Daniel, it's great to talk to you. Uh, we appreciate catching up with you, and wish uh, safety and health to you and Whitney and your kids. And uh, hopefully, we're talking football soon, and this uh, this whole thing calms down. Okay. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. You got it. Daniel Sorensen on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Deseret First, you know why. We show how. Uh, always nice to get a little uh, Chiefs Kingdom on the, uh, on the BYU Sports Nation. Super Bowl champion. Super Bowl champion. And he's so nonchalant. He's the most unassuming <laughs> yes. NFL yes. notable. I mean, he, and he's a guy that's making plays like Dirty Dan is legendary in Kansas City. Look, he's one of the biggest reasons why they beat the Tennessee Titans. Or, excuse me. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, Tennessee Titans. Correct. I was going to say, I'm trying to remember which comeback, <laughs> because we were down 10 in all of them and came back to win. I'm trying to remember which comeback on our way to the Super Bowl I lo- that was. I love it. When you talk about the Chiefs, it's always we and our. Look, that's what we do as fans. <laughs> I'm not faulting you. Yes. I get it. Enjoy it, man. One day Enjoy your it. Cincinnati Bengals will. <laughs> well, maybe not. My Bengals. <laughs> oh. They are your team, right? Absolutely. Okay. All right. I've never seen you in Bengals gear, ever. Uh, do you own Bengals gear? I do own some Bengals gear. Uh, maybe I should wear some. <laughs> maybe I should bring some to BYU Sports Nation. Here we go. We'll be right back with more of the best of BYU Sports Nation. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. Now a look at the path that Jake the Make Toolson took away from BYU to Utah Valley University and then back to BYU. This is Jake Toolson presented by Tim Daly Nissan in Deep Blue. Jake has had a unique journey during his college career. He arrived at BYU earlier than we all expected. So his first time around at BYU, it was kind of hard because he had just not gone on his mission, which he had been planning on and prepared for so long. And so that year was really hard for him, just like facing all the shame and guilt that he had. I wasn't necessarily ready for what I was getting myself into. Those were the times where I I had to dig deep and I had to, to really decide what I wanted for myself. And as much as he loved basketball, he knew that he had to take a step back and get healthy in all areas of his life in order for him to move forward. I was carrying so much weight from things that had happened in my life and and I needed to hit refresh and, and start clean. Sarah's support pushed me to be the best that I can. There was a time when, when I thought I wouldn't play basketball ever again. I, I didn't know, you know, where or how or if I was good enough. She really encouraged me to follow my dream because she knew that's what I loved. There's a lot of young women at the time, in my opinion, who would have cut and run. And she has been 
his rock throughout this whole journey. We'll love her forever for that. A lot of times when you think too much, get in your head, it's just, it makes things harder. So I feel like in that way, I've been able to support him and just help him relax and just have fun with this because in the end, what is it if you don't have fun, you know? He didn't know what the future held for him. As it turned out, it wasn't here at BYU. I decided to, to follow Coach Pope and, and go to UVU, play basketball. It's been kind of a crazy journey for me, but I'm grateful for it. And under Coach Pope's leadership, Jake really found himself as a player. And ever since, he's continued to just grow and develop, not just on the court, but we're so proud of who he is as a husband and as a father. And now he's come full circle to fulfill a dream that he had as a young boy. I don't know if I've ever seen a player grow more as a human being and as a basketball player in their college career than Jake Toulson. It's been astonishing and breathtaking and moving and inspiring what he's worked to become. Toulson up for three. 14 now for Jake. He's hitting 44%. He's become a great all-American basketball player. And what he's accomplished on the court pales in comparison to the human being that he's grown into. It's, it's been really special to be with him. Looking back now, I'm grateful for those experiences because they helped shape me into the person that I am and taught me a lot about life. When you're faced with adversity, you have a choice. You know, you could give into it and you could say, poor me, why is this happening to me? Or you can step up and you can say, you know what? I never thought this was going to happen, but I'm, I'm going to, to make something of it. And I'm, I'm going to do the best that I can. And I'm going I'm to put my faith in, in Heavenly Father. And, he, and he's going to direct me. And that's what I've tried to do. As Jake's college career comes to an end, it's been a time of reflection for me of, uh, of the journey. It's a great testament to faith and diligence and commitment, and those are the attributes that he's portrayed. Jake is one of those guys that he's not just a talker, he's gonna put the work in. When he gets a look in his eye, you know he's gonna make every shot, make every play. He's able to score at all three levels. He's one of the most efficient offensive players in all of college basketball. And defensively, he rarely shows up on our radar for defensive issues. He's become a great defensive ball screen. He's great in transition defense. He's rebounding the ball better and better every single day. He is an All-American, and it's not easy to get there. And to do it, you have to be a big-time player. He doesn't do anything halfway, you know? Like, he goes all in or not at all. Jake's one of those guys that off the floor, easygoing, loves talking about the NBA, loves talking about his kids, really cares, wants to get to know you. You know, he's a guy that his back's hurting him and he's going to go help his neighbor move. You know, he's just an unbelievable kid that way. Regardless of how the rest of the season goes and regardless of if he has a, a career after college, it doesn't matter because he has become a wonderful husband, a wonderful father, wonderful friend. We're so proud of him and Sarah and the family that they have. What a season for Jake Toulson and what a great story. Cute baby. Oh my goodness. He's got uh, he's got him ready, ready he can to make roll. shots like Jake. He's got him ready to roll. Yeah. Uh, look at the numbers that Jake the make put up. 15.2 points per game, shot almost 50% from the 47% from the three-point line. I don't know the NCAA minimums, but that on NCAA.com is listed as second best in the country. Uh, he made 85 threes, which was 26th in the country, um, 26 more than anybody else on the team. Uh, he led the team with a, a, in three-point field goals. He was an amazing piece to add. And when Mark Pope was hired as the coach, I said to you, ah, it'd be nice to get Jake back, but I don't, I don't see it. Because I just didn't think that Jake was going to come back. And he did. And he's talked about how this was the best year of his life. Not season of basketball. Year of his life. And so it was awesome to have Jake kind of put a, put a bow on his story of coming to BYU. And he's Danny Ainge's nephew. And he had a legacy, right? And, and he came and was an amazing part of one of the best BYU teams ever. Jake was so good that... 
with Yoli Child sitting out nine games, BYU was still able to go six and three. Him teamed up with T.J. Haas and the other seniors and Zach Selyus and Dalton Nixon. They they were a tournament team without Yoli Childs, yeah. probably on the bubble. Then they got Childs back and it took them to that next level. But he was so good that BYU, even without Yoli, were, was winning games on the road against Houston and beating Virginia Tech and UCLA and Maui. It's pretty incredible, the testament to what he was and what he meant to this BYU team. And in two games, the two biggest wins at home against St. Mary's, he sprains his ankle and just plays on it. What? And then against Gonzaga, he, he cracks his face into uh, Patrushev, and then he plays uh, the rest of those games. He's only out for a couple minutes. Yeah, then, crazy. Uh, he hits five threes, uh, most of them from outside Provo City limits against Gonzaga. Cougar Town, circle oh, five. Oh, my goodness. So, so fantastic. And uh, we're not done with Jake quite nope. yet. Join the conversation 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook using the hashtag BYUSN. The best of BYU Sports Nation rolls on after this. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Okay, it's time for the BYUSN Best Play Bracket. This is going to take us uh, another you know, two weeks or so to finish, which is exciting. Presented by doTERRA. A reminder, it's the top eight football plays versus the top eight basketball plays for play of the year. Yeah, so each day we're going to give you a matchup and you get an opportunity to vote and decide the winner as we whittle down those 16 plays down to the best play. So all you need to do is go to vote.byutv.org and cast your vote each day. The polls, they will close at 11 a.m. Eastern time each day and then we'll announce the results during BYU Sports Station, which is what we're going to do. Yes, the matchup that was uh, finished voting this morning as of 11 a.m. Eastern time was the Matt Bushman touchdown off of the reverse flea flicker against Boise State. Was that even hard? And T.J. Haas <laughs> off the back inbound and one versus Virginia Tech. And the winner, 69% to 31 Bushman TD versus Boise State moves on in the 3-6 matchup. Look, I want to live in a world where one offensive coordinator says, you know what, everybody has their own systems. Yes. Their own ways of doing things. Yes. I am, every play is going to have a, it's going to be involving a flea flicker. There will be different every variations play? of a flea flicker. You need to play Madden, bro. But I need to have somebody commit to a flea flicker as their offense. You only ran a lot of uh, plays. So, yeah, April 3rd coming up. You're gonna, you just saw the uh, next matchup there. So, yeah, Bushman, Flea Flicker will move on to face the winner of yesterday's matchup, which was the TJ House game winner at Houston. Uh, that'll be a fun in, yes. the, in the Elite Eight. Yes, it will. All right, so today's matchup. Let's go. Here we go. The basketball four seed is Yoli Child's exclamation point dunk mm. in the win over Gonzaga. Connor will drive it. Stop in the post. Hand off to Yo! And the two-hand hammer! That's how you do it! Tied out to Mark Few! The Cougs are going to win it! 91-76! to Under a minute to go! These boys have done it! The Mark Durant reaction. Dunk! <laughs> dunk! <laughs> that, that is... That was... That was it. Once that dunk went down, it was like game over. Yes. Love it. This takes on the football five seed, Dax Milne's 30-yard touchdown catch from Zach Wilson. A wonderful play against USC. Zach Gunn, play fake to Tyson. Zach throws to the 10, to the 5, caught at the goal line. Touchdown, Cougars! Touchdown, Cougars! And Dax Milne puts the Cougars back on top. Oh, into the bread basket. Give me that loaf. Oh, that was a beautiful <laughs> throw. Dax Milne, the former walk-on versus the, I believe that, that uh, particular corner was a four- or five-star guy. So Such a great day. That, for me, is the best win of the year. We, yeah, we debated this earlier. That, that for it was, me. It was Boise State versus USC. Some people think Tennessee. Yes. Um, but, yeah. That, that, was, that was my favorite of game those, of last year was USC. More of those, absolutely. Yeah, Go we'll to take as many vote, of those as we can. Vote.boatv.org to weigh in on... Child's dunk versus Milne, TD versus USA. And Milne's not done. Best play bracket presented by doTERRA. Reminder of how this works. Our selection committee (laughs) scoured all of the plays over the last athletic calendar year, found the top eight from BYU football and BYU basketball, and are now having them go head-to-head. Yeah in a 16-play bracket to figure out what is the best play of the season 
for BYU football or basketball. Yeah, and each day we're going to present you with a matchup, and then your vote is going to decide the winner as we whittle down those 16 plays to the best play. So here's what you need to do. You need to go to vote.byutv.org and cast your vote each day. The polls will close at 11 a.m. Eastern time each day. Then we're going to announce the results during BYU Sports Nation, which is what we're going to do right now. And wouldn't you know it, our first upset of the tournament the fifth seed, Dax Milne, touchdown catch against USC on a beautiful throw from Zach Wilson. Upsets the four seed, Yoli Childs, and his emphatic dunk to <laughs> seal the win against the Gonzaga Bulldogs. 61% of the vote goes to Milne over USC against Yoli's 39%. So a five seed moving on to the second round. See, this was a matchup I was I was really interested in because... In terms of just the play, if you're looking at just the play, the touchdown catch, the touchdown is 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 a is a more remarkable play. But the meaning of the yes. dunk from Yoli, yes. his last two points yes. as a senior at BYU, and it sealed the deal. You knew at that point BYU was winning the game against Gonzaga. I thought that may send it over the top. So I'm a, I'm a little surprised that that's the way that played out. All right. So in our first quadrant now, the Dax Milne touchdown catch against USC moves on to face Micah Simons. Rocky top revival catch <laughs> at Tennessee. Now for today's matchup. All right, here we go. The number one hoops seed is TJ Haas hitting the three-point game winner over the Gales. Toulson, 25 feet away, right side to TJ, left side, down to 10. TJ, pull up three. He oh! got it! He got it! No threes! TJ no threes. Haas scores it! Timeout! Timeout! <laughs> The look on his face after that is fantastic. It's the new St. Mary's face. And what I, what I remember about that shot is uh, <laughs> is jumping up and down in the, uh, in, in the, uh, the booth uh, when it went down. Uh, that's what I would remember. You and Greg Rebell, who was jumping up and down <laughs> yeah. courtside with yes. uh, Mark Durant. Yes, indeed. All right, the Haas game winner against St. Mary's takes on the second of our Dax Milne plays Ooh. in as many days. He is the football eight seed as well. An incredible touchdown catch in Tampa against South Florida. Play fake. Short drop for Jaron. Goes for the end zone looking for Milne. Dax Milne, did he haunt him with one arm? He did for touchdown! Dax Milne with a great grab! Love it. The one-handed catch. Dax Milne making his impact in the best play bracket. Yeah, the dudes he's a baller, and he's coming back, Jason. It's good news. Look, he's back for a while. Okay, so cast your vote going to vote.byutv.org. Uh-huh. Again, vote.byutv.org. We're looking at this right now. Are we going to have another upset in the uh, – is this th- – This would be a massive upset because T.J. Haas – and his game winner against St. Mary's is the number one basketball seed. I thought it was a foregone conclusion that that was going to advance on. That chalk just send it through. It's it is bouncing between uh, 51, 49 percent back and forth. Um, it is clear that the Milne family <laughs> has uh, made it a point to jimmer this poll and take it over. They've already they've already they've secured the, one yeah, upset. They've got the group chat sending it out, sending like, make sure everybody votes. He's already in the elite eight once. Like, is that not enough? Look, this would be a massive upset. <laughs> and right now, and again, this is going to fluctuate by the second, literally. It's 52 to 46 in favor of TJ Haas now. But this is, this is like, we could, we could say right now that, uh, that the, the race is too close to call at this point. Vote.byutv.org. Haas, game winner against St. Mary's, the one seed, looking to avoid the monumental upset from <laughs> Dax Milne at South Florida and a one handed touchdown catch. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Jaron, we've been avoiding this for as long as possible. We have? But, uh, now, we, uh, now we're going to do it. Let's go. Uh, Let's it's move. time to find out how good or bad our BYU basketball preseason projections were. Presented by BYU Food to Go, the MVP of your next event. Let's go. Starting with the leading scorer. 
Jerem, I said it would be Yoli Childs at 20 points a game. I said Yoli Childs 18.3, and you win because he was 22.2. You were close to the pin. Actual victory. Yeah. So point to me there. Okay. No, that's all moral victory, but yeah. On to the leading rebounder. I had Yoli Childs at 9 or 10 a game. Way to be specific. I said 10 plus. He averaged 9. Yoli. One more a game, bro. <laughs> Another point for me. Okay, so I'm up to nothing. I like what we're doing so far. Oh, you like because it it's good for you. Uh-huh, nice. exactly. Convenient. That's exactly right. Leading three-point shooter by makes. I yeah. said TJ Hobbs would be the guy with 60. I said uh, Jake Toulson would make 61, and Jake Toulson made 85. 80. So I was right by guy. So there you go. 80. Okay, so John gets his first point. Yeah. Leading three-point shooter in attempts, I had T.J. Haas with 162. I had Jake, uh, Jacob Toulson at uh, 150. He had 181. So I get it because I had the right guy again. Okay, so we're now 2-2. Two, two. Blank will lead BYU basketball in fouls this, this year. This is the Nate Austin Award. Uh-huh. I said Colby yeah. Lee would have the annual Nate Austin Award with 70 fouls. I said Connor Harding, 72. That was a dumb pick. <laughs> Connor Harding? <laughs> I thought he'd play the four a lot. We were confused on to, okay, Gavin Baxter's hurt. How much? We didn't think Colby Lee would be Colby Lee mm. at this point, right? Mm. So Dalton Nixon was the actual leader at 78. No points Dalton. awarded, and may Jimmer have mercy on your soul. I, yeah, I award you no points. <laughs> the regular season record. Now, this one I felt pretty good about. I got some oohs and ahs when I picked it. I said BYU would go 23 and 8. 10 and 5 in non conference, knowing that Yoli Childs was going to miss the first nine games, 13 and 3 in the West Coast Conference. I said 21 and 10. BYU surprised all of us, right? They were three games better. Uh, they were 24 and 7. So you get the point. You're okay. one game off. Point Spencer, back in front, 3 2. The record versus St. Zaga in the regular season. I had BYU winning two of those games yeah. against the Zags and Gales. Uh, I said 1 and 3. I, I thought it'd be uh, tough to get two, and uh, it wasn't. It was really easy. Again, this is in the regular season. The actual was 2-2, two and two, so I take a point there. Up 4-2, West Coast Conference record versus non-St. Zaga. We both went 11-1. Yeah. and one. Yeah, baby. Let's go, so, man. And, and the one was a one-point loss at San Fran. Okay. Rice a Roney. Next one, BYU will finish blank in the West Coast Conference. I said tied for second. They finished second. Yeah. I was initially awarded no points, but then I battled and got a half point out of that because it was a tie for second. So nice. I have a half point there. I said third. I thought St. Mary's would be better. But okay. BYU was better. Uh, and the last one, we were both way off. BYU will play in the blank tournament in the postseason. I thought NIT, man. I, I, I had PTSD from the previous uh, four yeah. years. I, thought, I said BYU would be on the bubble, probably in the NIT. And we were both right because they'd – oh, man, the season didn't happen. <laughs> Dang it. Final score. I had five and a half points. Jerem with three. 3.4. But you won the and one regular Yeah, season. no one cares about this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that wraps up the best of BYU Sports Nation this week. Tune in next Saturday for the Cougar news you need to hear. And catch the BYU Sports Nation simulcast every day at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific, on BYU TV and BYU Radio.